Okay, hi. 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 Um, hi. This is a talk about a side project. Uh, hi, I'm Tom. I have a really poor uh, track record with side projects, but this one's actually made it a little bit further than the idea stage for once. But I kind of need to say up front that only like not much past the idea stage, so, so bear with me. Um, but my talk's only kind of peripherally about the project. You can kind of take it or leave it. Uh, what I'm really here to say to you today is, if you think you have a skill set that you could use to protect somebody, you have a moral obligation to do so. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've, got other, I've got other stuff I'm going to say, but, but you can tune out after this slide, right? Because this is what matters. This is the only note that you need to write down. Um, and look, it might be a massive ethical and philosophical oversimplification, but it's a better direction in which to be wrong than like other choices you might make. Who uses Twitter a lot? You've got my condolences. Um, in, in a lot of ways, Twitter kind of seems like it was designed from the ground up to be the perfect tool for harassment, right? Everything's public by default. People broadcast directly to their followers, and people with a lot of followers can just use them as like a private army. And Twitter was designed to be the perfect platform for dogpiling. And dogpiling is when one user uses their followers to attack some other user, usually just for like expressing their opinions. Dogpiling is an emergent property that's fundamental to how Twitter was designed. If you're on there, you already know how ugly it can get, right? And this happens to me online like a little bit, but not much, and that's because I'm a middle-class educated white guy in tech, right? I have a profile of picture of myself standing with, with, with giving a talk in a nice suit jacket uh, at a conference behind a podium. I'm sort of stroking my beard in an in a intellectual, pondering, deep and meaningful sort of manner. I, I'm one of those people who has the privilege of my existence not being questioned every day. But if you're a woman or a member of any kind of marginalized group, Twitter can just be a sea of nightmares. They provide a couple sort of flawed, blunt mechanisms to deal with harassers. You can set your Twitter profile to private, and that locks it down, but it also tends to have the result of locking you out of the public conversations that you might have wanted to be a part of. Uh, Twitter lets you block or mute specific users. Blocking individual users doesn't do you any good if there are people stirring crowds of users against you. And it's the same problem with muting users, except it's even worse, because muted users can harass anyone who replies to you. And you just won't see it. You won't even know that it's happening. And Twitter, these days, has a report user and sort of report tweet function, and they're beyond useless. They're harmful. Uh, they've just become tools for organized harassment in themselves, as much as they were meant to be protecting you. Uh, nowadays, people just organize their followers to mass report an account of a marginalized person to knock them off. They just organize their followers to report you instead of harassing you directly. Twitter's not going to fix any of this anytime soon. Because here's the thing. This, honestly, this toxic model of interaction is great for engagement. And engagement, eyeballs on screen and thus eyeballs on promoted tweets, is the only metric that they're actually optimizing for. So you've heard this phrase before, right? Who, hands up who's read this before. You've seen this. You already knew this about social media. They're free because they collect and harvest information about you that they use for targeted advertising. And you already know this, and you, and you say you mind a little, but really you don't mind, because like, if you actually minded, you wouldn't be on there. But. That's because you think that you're a product, like how a nice car is a product, or like a professional consultant is a product, uh, but you're not, to, to, to these companies. You're the product like how a caged battery hen is a product. And it might not have been so bad through all that if, if your best interests aligned with theirs. But they don't. They're just here for the eggs, man. And your well-being, physical or emotional, is not among the metrics they're optimizing for. That's not where the money comes from. Sorry. So it's either quit or do it yourself. 
if you want something better and you want to remain on the platform and sort of remain a part of this big conversation while still having the ability to draw some boundaries and take some power back in terms of how people interact with you, you're going to have to do it yourself. Blocking individual users one at a time doesn't scale when someone's being attacked by a mob. Uh, one really successful tool sort of in this space is called Block Together. And it's a site where like-minded people can form lists of accounts and people can subscribe to block everyone on that list. It first came to prominence sort of around the Gamergate era and it's still quite a useful tool. It's a good idea and it's done pretty well, but it depends on someone having done the work of identifying bad actors and miscreants sort of ahead of time and having assembled that list for you. So now we come to what I've been playing with for the last little while. There were two things that I thought I wanted and that I sort of waited in vain for Twitter to get around to implementing themselves. Twitter doesn't provide any means to temporarily block or mute someone. You can't click a button and mute someone for say a week or block someone for a month. And you'd have to, so you'd have to sort of remember to unblock them yourself later if that was what you had decided to do. And I wanted something more like a timeout. I wanted something that you could quite freely use to cut off an unpleasant interaction and just turn it off for a month and not have to worry about it, but not necessarily be permanent. And that would actually encourage you to take this step to sort of protect yourself. And funnily enough, Twitter actually does understand the power of temporary blocks to encourage your use of a safety feature. They'll implement it so that uh, nerds can protect themselves from movie spoilers, but not so that you can protect yourself from Nazis. So the second thing that I wanted was a way to protect yourself from the dog pile. And so if you need to block someone who's attacking you and someone who's trying to sort of set your, their followers on you as well, you probably also need to take their followers out of the equation as well. So that's what I decided to build. A tool which you can use to basically just click a button and mute or block a harasser and all of their followers for a set period of time, say like six weeks or 12 weeks or like 30 weeks, right? Just, just Put them in a timeout box, let them cool off, let them not be able to reach you, let them find something else to do with their time. Because let's actually be clear here, blocking someone on Twitter is not actually a hostile act, it's a time management strategy. If someone's, if someone's harassing you on Twitter and you block them, that means that both you and them agree that your time is more valuable than their time. So that's the project. And so for the rest of this talk, I'm gonna take you through what I thought have been some of the interesting parts of taking what's honestly a pretty simple idea and then turning it into an app. First one that was just for private use and then one that like actual people can, can come to in a time of need and, and use. And at its core, it actually really is a simple idea. Um, can people at the back read this code? Cool. So it's a really simple idea. This is all the business logic. This code just does three things. It grabs your Twitter API credentials. It iterates through each page of an account's followers. I'm using... Um, a standard Python Twitter API library that's available on PyPI. It iterates through each page of an account's followers and it sends a block request to every ID received per page. And it just sleeps when you hit Twitter's rate limit. It'll just like block and wait. And then once the rate limit time has passed, it'll just start resuming. It's pretty straightforward. So what does it take to take an idea that's kind of this simple and sort of expressible on one slide and turn it into a web app that people can actually use? Uh, can everyone read this code at the back? <laughs> I mean, this isn't a surprise to any of you, right? Uh, Django can't shield you from how complicated a web application needs to be just to do the basics. So what makes it so much more complicated? Well, celery, for one thing. Uh, who uses Celery? Celery's amazing. I tried not to use it for this project for a while, but I came back to it because it was the only thing that had the features that I needed. All the, all the useful work that a web app like this does happens somewhere, that, somewhere different than a web view. Uh, in the script I showed you before, all the work was done in a single loop and it was blocking when it hit the rate limit. Uh, it could take a really long time just sending all those API calls sequentially. And I want this to be able to work fast and scale out for lots of users, regardless of how slow the API is or how strict the rate limiting is. So it's all built as sort of asynchronous tasks where for the most part, each task handles one and only one interaction with the Twitter API. So you've got like a task that blocks a user, a set celery tasks in this case, but that's just an implementation detail. Celery task that blocks a user, a task that unblocks a user, a task that retrieves a page of followers. The pages are all locked down to 5,000 accounts per page. 
um, then the, all of those tasks can be farmed out to Celery to a scalable cluster of workers that can process them. And the complexity there is in orchestrating and scheduling all those tasks, because every time you retrieve a page of, say, 5,000 followers, you have to spawn off 5,000 more tasks, one for each action taken on those followers. And if an operation is rate limited, it needs to not block other tasks from proceeding. So once the rate limit has expired, it needs to be able to resume where it left off. There needs to be sort of a weighted back off mechanism to make sure that the code reacts smoothly to load. So it all just adds up, right? And then there's like the part of this that I'm really bad at, which is user interfaces. Uh, I'm better Python coder than HTML coder. Um, but people, unfortunately, do need to be able to log in. They need to be able to actually do the thing. And they need to be able to log out again or disconnect entirely if they want nothing to do with the app. And they also need you know, guardrails. You need to have code that doesn't allow a user to block all of their own followers, which is a hilarious accidental button push. Uh, you want to make sure that what they ask the system is sort of finite and achievable. You don't want them to accidentally try to block 107 million people at once. Um, there are limits to how many people you can block, not necessarily just enforced by Twitter, but just by the passage of time. Uh, you don't want someone to try to block all of Twitter, even if you sympathize. <laughs> so even simple ideas like this, like something you can convey as a screen full of code ends up being pretty complex once you try and build it for the real world. And complexity means that there's more stuff that can go wrong, and it means that there's more stuff that's exploitable by attackers. So this would be a problem for any web app, right? Even toy side projects, but this toy side project is intended for use by people who are vulnerable and people who might already be being attacked. So if they're hoping that something like this, that, if they're hoping that something like this will protect them, then first and foremost, it better not expose them even worse. So we're gonna talk a little bit about threat modeling. Um, and we're just gonna be informal about this. I was gonna like have a slide, like a high school uh, essay where it's like, you know, the definition of threat modeling on Wikipedia says blah, 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 blah. Uh, but what we're just gonna do now is we're just gonna brainstorm out as much as you can about who might try to attack a project like this, why they might try and do it, what resources they might have at their disposal, how they'd probably do it, and most importantly, what would happen next. And you've gotta do this with all of your work because you need to decide, given the trade-offs, what the next most important thing you can do to, is to keep people safe. You can't make it perfect, right? You have to prioritize. So who might try to attack my code? The first obvious choice is everyone, right? The simple internet background noise that everyone has to deal with, you know, automated scans, bots, scripted whole internet attacks just kind of looking for low-hanging fruit. And to be honest, if you're using Django and you keep your systems up to date and you've got SSL set up and you don't turn on debug mode, uh, you're already in pretty decent shape here. People targeting the project specifically are a lot scarier. Um, they might be motivated to do so based on someone using it to prevent them from having their fun. Uh, they might have time at their disposal. They could clone the repository, see how it works, plan their attacks. They can investigate the dependencies in the source code and go looking for vulnerabilities in them. So there's, there's it's a much more sort of dangerous persona of threat. And then finally, right now, especially, the number one threat is you guys. Um, most of you in here know Python. A lot of you are familiar with Django. You might have already cloned the GitHub repository. You're bored, and you know the maintainer's busy. Thankfully, I'm sure you're all lovely people. Right? So what does Secateur have that an attacker would want? Most of what Secateur stores in its database is publicly extractable from Twitter anyway. It's public account profiles, it's follower lists, who follows who, stuff like that. But there's information in there that is private and needs to be protected. Uh, the lists of who a user blocks and mutes are not publicly available on Twitter. They're, they're personal. But most importantly, OAuth credentials. And this is scary, because if an attacker can obtain a user's cr credentials, 
their OAuth tokens, along with Secator's global Twitter API credentials, then they can do anything that Secator can do with that account. Twitter, in particular, does not have very fine-grained control over application privileges. There are only three levels. There's basically read-only, almost everything, and everything. <laughs> and the permissions that Secator requires are the almost everything ones because blocking a user is kind of a, a profile-specific operation. Um, now, can, can you guys read that? Read tweets from your timeline, see who you follow, and follow new people, update your profile, post tweets as if it was you, uh, and what it doesn't say there, but according to the Twitter documentation, it can send DMs as you. The, 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 the read and write permission will allow it to send DMs. The only difference, the only difference between the uh, read and write and the sort of everything one is the everything one will let it read private messages as well. So the only privilege that this app doesn't ask for is the ability to read your private messages. So if this is freaking you out a little bit, right? Now is the perfect time to go to your Twitter settings page and see all the apps that you've already given this permission to. Because <laughs> if you've ever like posted a photo on Instagram to Twitter, then Instagram can send DMs as you if it wants to and update your profile. You've, you've already given this permission to people you didn't realize you gave it to. Okay, so. An attacker would want to get these keys, and then they could do pretty nasty things. You'd need the global variables, uh, which are the OAuth consumer key and consumer secret that are unique to Secator. And then you'd need an individual user's OAuth token and their OAuth token secret. So we'll start with the global consumer keys, right? They're delivered, the way I've built, the way I've built this, they're delivered to the application by environment variables by Docker, so sort of 12-factor app style. So what route would an attacker take to get these credentials? Let's go from sort of the hardest to the easiest. Well, achieve remote code execution directly against the Django app. If you can actually somehow execute arbitrary Python code against Secateur, you can just ask for the settings, right? That's basically a worst case scenario. Uh, there's not a lot you can do about that except hope that Django's reasonably locked down. And, it's, and, and this is non-trivial, this is pretty difficult. Django in its history since 20, 2005 has only had one documented known remote code execution vulnerability. It's had security issues, you know, there's a lot of bits and pieces. But only once has there actually been an RCE, I think, in Django itself. So it's rare, it's rare, but it's not unheard of. Uh, but it would be pretty hard work to, to, to try and break in that way. You'd be far better off just trying to compromise the host. So if you compromise the server on which this is running, you might be able to get at these credentials, but you'd still, it depends on how you got in there, because you'd still possibly have to escalate their privileges to root before they could read the file um, that has the keys in them, or possibly even execute a Docker, a Docker escape, which is, again, not unheard of, but not easy. Um, or, if you can access the server as me, you can just go straight to the account, because they're there, right? Um, some slightly easier ways you might do it. Um, if I accidentally turned on debug mode, uh, then they might just end up sitting there. Uh, Django's debug mode actually does filter out settings that have words like secret or password or key in them. They get starred out on that nice yellow debug page, but they don't get starred out in stack traces. So if someone's, if, if, if debug mode is turned on and someone can trigger an error and that error is anywhere in the API flow, then you'd be able to see local variables, which just never allow it to be possible to turn on debug mode on a production instance. Just, just don't let it be a thing. Um, but when it comes to these global keys, the lowest hanging fruit is my own Twitter account. If you compromise that, then you can just go straight to developer.twitter.com and take the credentials. Twitter don't care. They don't protect your API keys from repeated access. If you use AWS, you know that they at least have the security mechanism of when you generate security keys, they only show you the secret key once. Uh, Twitter doesn't do that. You can go straight to the web page and you could just grab them straight from there. Um, 
Now, hopefully that, hopefully that still wouldn't be easy because neither my Twitter password or my password manager password are guessable and both have multi-factor authentication. But nevertheless, it's pretty clear based on this that the most important next security step is nothing to do with the code. It's for me to create a new Twitter account for the sole purpose of administering the app and to keep it off of my day-to-day -day usage of, of, of Twitter. And the other half of the credentials that you'd need in order to compromise this would be the user-specific OAuth token and secret. And they're stored in a Django model by a third-party Django app I'm using, which is a Python social auth, which is excellent. If you need to do in um, OAuthy type stuff with third-party apps, it's, it's pretty great. Um, the credentials are stored in plain text in the database, which isn't ideal, um, but they can't be hashed because you actually need the plain text credentials to do API operations, you could probably paper over that by encrypting them in the database, but that doesn't buy you much because code exec on the app would still compromise the keys. It would only really protect you from mislaid backup databases or SQL injection, maybe. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't buy you much to try to further obfuscate those keys. Uh, with one exception, which was the Django social app doesn't really treat that field as sensitive in the Django admin, which I thought was a bit of a bummer. So as sort of an extra precaution, rather than having those keys just available to anyone who was able to score admin access on the app, um, conveniently, you can kind of just monkey patch the admin setting in Django and just exclude that field entirely, and then it doesn't show up. So at that point, if someone compromised, say, my laptop and... Got, or got access to the Django admin access on the app, you could still do some damage and you'd probably get access to some sensitive information, but those keys that you really wanted, you wouldn't get those. You'd still have to get code exec somehow. So with all that said, where does that leave our threat model? By the standards of web apps, I, I, think, it's, I think it's pretty secure. I'm, I'm better at securing things than I am making good UIs for them. Uh, but if someone needs a tool like this, it's because they've already been targeted, right? It's because they've already been attacked. And there's no, there's no ethical way for me to tell anyone in that position that they just have to trust me in order to use it. So if you're actually putting your users first, and if you're actually trying to do something like this to protect people, the last crucial element uh, is to open source it. Like, you, you can't, you can't, you can't, allow them to have to, you can't make them have to rely on you. And this wasn't actually a given. Like, when I was first working on this, I wasn't sure I'd open source it because I was worried about exposing the code and letting people analyze it because it's, it makes it a target. Um, and hell, I kind of thought it might be monetizable a little bit or like I'd, I could like make back server costs by taking donations or something. But there's no moral argument for that, right? There's, I can't put, I can't put a user's protection behind some kind of paywall. And so if I'm really trying to be on the side of people who might need a tool like this, I'm absolutely obligated to make sure that they're not forced to trust anyone in particular or someone like me in order to use it. Uh, because in the, in the end, if you think you have a skill that you could use to protect somebody, you have a moral obligation to do so. Um, and that's actually my talk. Thank you so much for listening. I say we probably have some time for questions, huh? If anyone has any, how? What's the state of the app? Ugly, but quite functional. <laughs> um, he just asked what the state of the app was right now. And so it is usable and in use, um, and the UI sucks. And there's a lot more quite important, useful functionality I need to add before I, like, you can use it to block a bunch of people, but at the moment, there's not a simple way for people to then go through it and go, oh, I didn't mean to block that dude, I'll unblock them. You'd have to go back through your own stuff. So there's useful things missing. Um, Patch is welcome. Hey. Hey, Tom. Um, so one of the things you mentioned was um, not being able to block a lot of people, and so there are some um, abusive people on Twitter that might have hundreds of thousands or millions of followers. What is the scale that you've found that it, this tool is effective to? Okay, so you can't block all Donald Trump's followers. Uh, but what you can do is you can find 
a particularly nasty person who has tens of thousands of followers and block all of them, and you can find another person with tens of thousands of followers and block all of them. And if you do that a couple times, suddenly you realize that you've already got most of the bastards because, sorry, you've already got most of the people who you'd like to, like to be rid of because it, Twitter is very self-organized and clustering. Um, at the moment, I have arbitrary limits on here where you can only block the followers of someone who has 50,000 or less, but that's arbitrary. The rate limiting that I was talking about, Twitter's rate limiting is pretty weird and not entirely predictable. There is no rate limit on the blocking API call. Uh, and I think that's grandfathered in because of tools like Block Together. I think there are a lot of tools that block users, and so I think that they're not going to suddenly apply a rate limit there anytime soon. Muting has a very strict rate limit of about 150 users every 15 minute window. So if you were trying to mute a bunch of people, it can take all day uh, just to mute someone who has you know, a couple thousand followers. So yeah. at the moment that limit is arbitrary while I am sort of still, while the app is still young, um, I could get away with increasing it probably quite a lot. Uh, but I think there's diminishing returns there because there's sort of, yeah, I've, I've used it to block several hundred thousand people when I was just experimenting. Um, and that was pretty straightforward. And I actually think that that is where most of the threat comes from. Once someone has millions of followers, they're probably, I kind, of, I kind of figure maybe they're hopefully doing something other than attacking slobs on Twitter. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, there's, there's an upper limit there just in terms of practicality. I could beef up the servers and I could horizontally scale this out quite widely and we could, we could see how far it can be pushed. Um, so yeah, there's, the, there's no rate limit on the blocking but there's just how much time you got. And then the muting one is still very strict and Twitter might change it arbitrarily at any point. You're kind of at their mercy there. Ben? You, there we go. Have you done any threat modeling on sort of the impact that this could directly place onto you by being the creator of this app with like, because your GitHub name is out there, how like your DNS creds, that kind of stuff. Have you done anything to sort of cover yourself when it comes to building a tool like this that, you know, assholes with too much time on their hands can just start and play with? A little, but only in so far as my GitHub account has also got 2FA on it. Most of, most of what's important to me has reasonable protections on it. My real name is, of course, everywhere. Um, I am Tom Eastman. That is actually on my birth certificate. I'm findable. Someone could hack my runkeeper and possibly find out where I lived. There's, there's interesting things once you become a target yourself. Um, I, again, get to bask in the safety of looking the way I do, people treat me with respect, which is unfair and weird. Um, yeah, if someone decided to backlash on me for a tool like this, there, uh, living in Wellington is kind of handy. <laughs> um, <laughs> they'd have to, they, it, it, it depends on their resources, doesn't it? Um, they, would bounce off of, they would bounce off of most of my accounts that they might want to try to mess with. Everybody can fall victim to a well-timed phishing attack. Um, it's a, it's it's worth pondering. Yeah, I don't have a, I don't have a specific answer, but it's something to always be thinking about. Up there, all the way up there. Uh, if you just shout, I can repeat the question. Well, I can, re and then I can. No, go, Lucy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, hi, Tom. The, uh, have you thought about uh, recursively blocking the followers of the followers in case the general has lieutenants which command sub armies? I think it would be I think it would be a recipe for pain really fast. So no, I don't think that's I don't think that's feasible because if you you know six degrees of separation, yeah. right? But <laughs> but you do that you do that two or three degrees and you probably have everybody on Twitter. Um, now. This app at the moment is just, you pick one person and it blocks, their, it blocks their followers. There are really interesting potential other things you could do. Like if you identified a bad person and another bad person, another bad person, and you took the intersection of everyone who follows those three and you use that as an indicator of those are the sorts of people who I don't really want in my life, that's actually how, um, 
I was talking about block together earlier, and famously that was used uh, to help protect people from attacks um, during the Gamergate days. And the Gamergate block list was produced using using something like that by 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 identifying the instigators and then sort of taking the intersection of all of their followers. So hypothetically, you could do you could you could pull that kind of data and do some sort of analysis like that, but it immediately becomes a graph theory, uh, set intersection-y, computer science-y problem that at the moment it's all stored in a relatively simplistic model in, post in Postgres. I'd probably need to start using Neo4j or some kind of interesting graphing database to make that feasible for lots of users at once because every user might pick different people who they wanted to process the intersections of. There's, there's interesting ideas there, but some of them get complex fast, especially if you're just trying to do it uh, especially if you're not just doing it for yourself. Like if I chose a bunch of people and I took the intersection of them and said, I'm gonna block all you people, that's, that's computationally pretty easy. If I want every user of the system to be able to pick people arbitrarily, it gets, it gets messier fast. So probably not anytime soon. Ben again, what's up? <laughs> oh, so sorry. Cool. Does your tool leave any fingerprints that the person blocked can see that it was blocked by your tool? Or um, I'm actually not on Twitter, so do they? Do you actually get told that you're blocked? No, uh, Twitter's block mechanism is one of the few things they actually did kind of right, where um, it doesn't notify them that they've been blocked. It doesn't do anything like that. You just can't see them and you can't interact with them anymore. Um, so nothing like that, unless you did something like gloat about it, which is something that I've occasionally done when I've. When, 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 someone, when someone is being aggravating on Twitter, I've been known in the past to sort of reply to them and go, you know, I've, I've, I've already blocked all of your followers, so it's just kind of you and me in the room now. Let's talk. Um, <laughs> weirdly enough, weirdly enough, without all their followers, suddenly they don't want to. Um, so only, only if you're doing something like that, only if you're doing something like, like gloating about it a little bit. But if you were, if you were actually using this to just I need to cut this off so that I can go about my day without anxiety. You wouldn't do that. You'd just, you'd just block them and, and, and go on with your day. So, yeah, so no. Ben, you had one more question? Um, when it comes to holding the OAuth credentials for an individual, do you think that you could make the app not store them in the database by forcing a user to auth against Twitter every time they Auth against Segatur, or just auth every time? Yes, and that would, have, that would have solved the whole thing, except I wanted the auto unblock after a period of time. So if I'm scheduling an unblock operation six weeks later, I need the credentials. If, I, if it wasn't for that one feature, if it wasn't for that auto unblock after a period of time, I would only need the credentials while they did the one thing, and then I could delete them again, yeah. Um, how do you deal with new followers? So if you block for six months and uh, in three Sorry? months, new, f new followers. So new followers. If, that, if that person, if you block them for six months and they get 10,000 new followers. Nah, at the moment it's just, um, it's iterating, it's, it's retrieving the list of followers at the time that you do the operation and blocking them as it iterates through all of them and it doesn't follow up with more with them later. So again, like that sort of functionality would be more like what I was saying before, where you could sort of tag someone and say, anyone who's following this person now and in the future. Um, so you can you could you could conceive of making a tool that every once once a month or two would like re-update the list and then. But no, I haven't done that. Uh, behind you, Lucy, and, and to the side of you. Um. Have you think about uh, making a um, front-end version of your program which can run in JavaScript on the browser side so you don't have to store the credential for the person? So you are absolutely not at risk of being compromised. So, like I, I haven't. Uh, I haven't, but there's a tool that does that. So if you didn't want to use something like this and you just wanted to block all the followers of someone, I think there's an extension, and you'll love this, it's called blockchain. It's the one useful blockchain. 
It's the one useful blockchain. I don't know who wrote it. I can't vouch for it. But there's, there's tools that do that. And they do it by manipulating your web browser. They're not a web app in themselves. Um, I think we're out of time. Thank you very much. <laughs>